Thanks, Jeff. Um, it's great to have you all here with us tonight. Um, you know, the thing uh, I was thinking about this, the, the, the panel we have tonight, it's really like with two people, you, you, you guys are lucky you get like 10 people <laughs> because the, 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 the breadth of experience and the work that uh, my colleagues have done is, is just remarkable. Um, Sylvia Longmire, Chris Blatchford, uh, between the two of them, uh, Sylvia's worked uh, with state, uh, f federal government, armed forces, uh, worked outside of the, all those systems. Uh, uh, Chris has worked in print and TV journalism. Uh, uh, both, of course, are authors. Um, Sylvia, Border Insecurity and Cartel, and Chris uh, has the book The Black Hand, uh, all three of which will be available tonight, as I understand it. And, um, you know, both of them live uh, where these issues are playing out in different parts of the country, uh, Sylvia in Tucson and Chris in Southern California. So, again, between the two of them, uh, we're really privileged to, to, to be able to um, uh, benefit from, from the, the, the breadth of experience they have, the good work they've done. And uh, uh, I look forward to hearing from them. And then we're going to talk amongst ourselves. And then at the end, uh, uh, we would definitely welcome and appreciate uh, your input and questions as well. So uh, first, I think we'll hear from Sylvia. Uh, thank you very much for, <coughs> for coming tonight. Um, I can't emphasize enough how significant uh, the current situation is in Mexico and also along the border. This is uh, kind of an <coughs> unprecedented situation as far as uh, the way that Mexican drug cartels are, are operating south of the border, the measures that they're taking to bring illegal drugs uh, into the United States, and also how it's impacting law enforcement, how it's impacting Americans across the United States, how it's impacting our national security. Uh, and th things that are occurring, particularly here in the United States, um, these are activities that are happening in our neighborhoods. It, it, these are activities that are not just limited to California, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Texas. Uh, drug cartels are, are providing 90% of the illegal drugs that are in demand, uh, that are being used in the United States. Uh, that means that anywhere that people are using drugs or demanding drugs, you're going to find some kind of cartel presence. You're going to see, or you're actually not going to see uh, the trucks, the cars, the people couriering all these drugs through our major highways, through cities like Atlanta, Las Vegas, Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, Phoenix, Los Angeles. Um, and all of this is happening right under our noses, yet it affects the very fabric of our, our communities. And I think that's, that's worth um, learning a little bit more about what's happening. Uh, now the big controversial issue is, is immigration, you know, immigration reform. Um, I'm a contributing editor for Breitbart, Texas, so we've been writing a lot about the, the, the surge in immigration that's been happening in South Texas. The, the families, the women, the children that are, that are all coming because of the, um, the horrible security and economic situation in, in Central America. While that's happening, the cartels are taking advantage of that because they control uh, the human smugglers, the coyotes that are charging anywhere from three to $8,000 per person to bring them from Central America through Mexico to the border. Um, so this is a situation that's affecting communities along the border, and then all those folks are are looking for refuge throughout the country. So um, I think it's a topic worth becoming smart on. I think it affects not just folks along the border, but throughout the country. And I'm uh, very appreciative that you're taking time out of your schedules to come and, and learn a little bit more about how these, uh, how these issues affect all of us. Okay, great. Well, Sylvia is not only prettier than I am, she's smarter than I am. So forgive me, I'm gonna work from some notes <laughs> here a little bit. But. <laughs> I'd like to start with an anecdote that I believe cuts right to the point as to why we're all here talking about cartels and organized crime today. And not that long ago, I was standing in a small apartment on Los Angeles' west side, and a Mexican woman in her late 30s named Teofila Rodriguez lived there with her only son. Now, her husband had been killed a year earlier when he was caught in a crossfire of some gang-related incident in Los Angeles. The family had come to America about six years earlier, like so many other immigrants, looking for a better way of life here. She worked all day in a clothing factory for minimum wage and still dreamed of a better life for her son, Rudy. His eighth grade teacher was also in the room there with me and his mom. She told me that Rudy was a, a friendly, happy kid who always had a smile on his face. 
He loved sports and like so many other American kids dreamed someday that he would uh, be a baseball major league pitcher. Now, Rudy's mother sat on the edge of her bed in the corner of the room while I was talking to the teacher. Not because <coughs> she didn't speak English, but because every time she started to speak, sobs clogged up her throat and choked back her words. And as I looked at her and saw those wet red cheeks dripping with tears, I also saw my own mother who lost a son at a younger age. I saw the faces of a trail of moms, grieving moms I'd interviewed during the past three decades in the Los Angeles area. And the faces of those moms were black and white and brown and Asian. And I couldn't help to note that the tears in their eyes were all the same color. And so was the pain in their heart. Her son Rudy wasn't in a gang. He had no tattoos, no baggy pants, no shaved head. He was simply walking home from school when gang members from another neighborhood jumped out of a car, chased him down an alley, shot him eight times, and left him for dead. Now, a neighbor came out and found him, his little body convulsing in the street. He died in the hospital about an hour later. Just a nice kid in the wrong place, the wrong time, caught up in some gang rivalry that he actually had nothing to do with at all. All his hopes and all his dreams as a kid died along with him. His mom, for the rest of her life, haunted by the senseless murder, left alone with her daily tears and broken hopes for what could have been. And she will live with that for the rest of her life. Now, what's even more heartbreaking is this. There are thousands, thousands of moms like her across the United States today. <clears throat> According to Wikipedia, as many as 15,000 people a year die in gang-related violence across the United States. Now, if that many people die each year from a certain disease, we would call it a national epidemic. And compare it to this figure. From the year 2003 to 2012, about 5,000 American soldiers were killed in the Iraqi war. 15,000 people on our streets in America in gang-related violence. In the Los Angeles area alone, going back to the 1980s, there have been roughly 500 to 1,000 gang-related deaths every year. Many of them, at least a third of them, the cops estimate, were just innocent people in the wrong place at the wrong time, like young Rudy. The FBI now reports in 1991 there were an estimated 250,000 gang members in the United States. Now, the FBI estimates there are about 1.4 million gang members in the United States and as many as 33,000 different gangs. The feds say about 70,000 of those gang members live in Los Angeles. I've seen other estimates up to about 120,000, and I tend to believe those more. That argu arguably makes Los Angeles the gang capital of the United States. And those LA gangs have migrated across most of the country <clears throat> and into Mexico <clears throat> and into Central America. Now, the Mexican Mafia was founded in 1957. It started as a prison gang in California, and its influence has spread exponentially in the last 20 years. Now, Joe Morgan, the godfather of the Mexican Mafia, a man known as Pegleg, had a relationship with a Mexican heroin kingpin back in the 1970s. But he was really about the only one. The organization as a whole was not that organized back then as it is today. Now, in the early 90s, a new generation of Mexican Mafia members, some refer to them as the Pepsi generation, clearly expanded their influence in California and also moved south of the border. At that time, in the early 90s, there were an estimated 50 to 60,000 gang members in Los Angeles. And the mafioso enacted a plan at that time to unite all the Latino gang members under the Mexican Mafia umbrella. The plan was that all the gangs would not only buy their drugs from the Mexican Mafia, but would also kick back part of the profits on all those drugs that they sold in the street. It gave the Mafia a virtual instant army of thousands of gangsters in Southern California working for them, selling drugs, doing hits, and extorting other drug dealers who weren't part of their program. Now, if a certain gang or a certain gang member didn't go along with this program, he was put on, or the gang was put on, what they call a green light list, 
which meant all the other Latin gangs in the South.